feel this will help the situation. But I somehow think that, you know, uh, the body reminds of me, my body reminds me when, you know, I need to start implementing certain Keep procedures like stretching, <clears throat> yoga uh, always seems to protect my lower back. So I'm going to start doing that again. Plus, <clears throat> no sugar and also um, all kinds of anti inflammatory foods like ginger, turmeric, black pepper, oils. Inflammation and creating an environment that your white blood cells thrive in, and that other um, you know harmful invaders <laughs> will be less likely to thrive in. Also, have it. The source of which can be many things. Um, well, there's one ultimate one at the center of it. However, this is all to say that I think, uh, you know, it was funny because right before I pulled my back, I was like, my back has been great. I've, you know, I've been working uh, extra hard, doing all these weird. Your movements, because I've been in the <clears throat> lay block in precarious situations. And uh, so <laughs> I thought, well, man, I can't believe my back's doing so good. Five seconds later, I lift the mortar bag and, oh, it just, I can feel it go out and it's crazy. We, the strength that is housed in the spine and the sudden awareness of that. <laughs> so, it's not too bad. I've learned over the years that to baby it now will save me loads of pain and also time and money. So instead, I'm going to do an episode of The World's Strangest Mysteries. Now, this story here, I picked this one. It's not a random one. And it's the reason why I got this book. Uh, so we're in the mystics and medium section. And this story is about... A man named Harry Edwards. <clears throat> Harry Edwards was considered by many to be the greatest spiritual healer this country has ever known. Okay. <laughs> Have you ever heard of this guy? Just something to keep consider. <clears throat> White haired, stocky, dark suited. He could have been taken for any city businessman, except for one thing. His charisma was such that he drew thousands to watch him heal in public, and thousands more were inspired to write letters to him. He was, he claimed, guided by the spirits of Lord Lister, the founder of antiseptic surgery, and by Louis Pasteur, the great French scientist. His patients ranged from the very poor to members of the royal family. <clears throat> His patient, uh, 
royal family, foreign rulers, cabinet ministers, army commanders, judges, and bishops. Lady Baden-Powell, wife of the founder of the Boy Scout movement, was a regular visitor to the spiritual healing sanctuary at Sheer, Sheer, <clears throat> deep in the Surrey countryside. So I'm assuming England or Australia, I don't know. So too was Princess Marie Louise, granddaughter of Queen Victoria. Famous conductor, Sir Adrian Bolt, received healing from him. So did the ex-queen of Spain. With strong workmanlike hands, he seemed to achieve miracles by soothing away pain, remolding twisted limbs, banishing disease, and restoring sight and hearing. He did not always have to be in the same room. Sometimes he achieved what he called absent healing when he was hundreds of miles away from his patient. Huge files exist, bulging with letters confirming that his treatment had worked, yet he had never he never had any medical or surgical training and was not instructed in any school of psychology. His origins were quite ordinary. Harry Edwards was born in, Cra uh, in Crayford Street, Islington, in 1893. The eldest of nine children, his father was a compositor in the printing industry. His mother, the driving force of the family, who lived into her 90s to see him become famous, worked as a court dressmaker for a firm which had premises at the back of the Liberties in Regent Street, London. That was one sentence. <laughs> he was a young tearaway, a holy terror, who was constantly being punished for some misdeed or other. <clears throat> the family moved house several times in South London, but his formative years were in Wood Green, he became a reformed character when he fell in love with a butcher's daughter at the age of 12. After leaving school at 14, he was apprenticed to a publishing house where his first job was a, a floor sweeper at six shillings a week. He slowly climbed the ladder until he became a reader, <clears throat> checking printers, proofs for error, Discovering politics, he became an ardent liberal, often standing on a soapbox at Hyde Park Corner to support his cause. But he was not successful as a candidate and had to content himself with being an organizer. During the First World War, he served with the Royal Sussex Regiment. He started off in the ranks but when his battalion embarked for service in India in 1915, he found himself promoted by degrees after a crash course in engineering, including bridge building, which he swore lasted no longer than 60 minutes. He was sent off to join the general headquarters of the Mesopotamian <laughs> Expeditionary Force in Baghdad. One day, he was sent for by General Marshall, Marshall <clears throat> who asked him if he would like a commission. Edwards thought this preferable to being corporal <laughs> and answered, yes, sir. Uh, that's a huge, um, huge jump in ranking. <clears throat> After being commissioned in the field, he was sent to Tekrit a walled Arab town not far from Baghdad, where he found himself in charge of a wild bunch of nomadic Arabs with instructions to lay a railway track between Tekrit and Baghdad. He was remarkably successful. <clears throat> and so impressed his superiors, he was sent to the sun-baked hills of northwest Persia, now Iran, 
with the grand title Assistant Director of Labor, Persian Lines of Communication. He ended up with the rank of acting major and the task of building roads and bridges strong enough to carry military equipment in the most inhospitable terrain. Strangely enough, it was here as a slender, fair-haired young officer that Harry Edwards showed the first glimmer of his great gift for healing. Local labor was used, and that meant women and children as well as able-bodied men clamored for jobs. Casualties were high, if not serious, among the unskilled workers. And the director, with little more than iodine, bandages, and castor oil in his medical kit, found himself expected to cure everything. Strangely enough, he found even chronic conditions of illness among these rough hill people responded to his quiet touch. Soon, everyone in the area had heard of him, the great Hakim. One day, a local sheik decided to bring his aged mother for treatment. The frail old lady had been placed in a sort of curtain-tamed box on the side of a horse, and one look told Major Edwards that she was pitifully weak, in great pain, and not far from death. He knew he could not ask the sheik to take her away and let her die in peace. He would most likely have been killed for refusing his treatment. On the other hand, he had not the remotest idea what was wrong with her, and had only the contents of his primitive medicine box to deal with the emergency. After examining her carefully, laying his hands on her body and praying for inspiration, he quickly prepared a potion from carbolic tooth powder. He gave it to her with trepidation and groaned inwardly as the satisfied sheep took her away again with a large bottle of Akeem's medicine. When the sheik returned again a few days later, accompanied by an escort of tribesmen yelling and firing off their rifles, Edward thought he was about to meet his end. <laughs> Instead, the sheik greeted him with joy, saying he had come to tell the great Hakim that his mother was completely recovered. <laughs> was free from pain and looking better than she had done for years. To show his gratitude, he had brought gifts of carpets and gold, pieces worth a fortune. Edwards had to refuse, but pressed to accept a gift of some kind mentioned he would like to have some fresh eggs for breakfast. Next day, 300 arrived. Though the war ended in 1918, it was not until three years later that acting Major Edwards arrived home. He married Phyllis White, a farmer's daughter from Long Brady in Dorset, who had written to him all through the long years he had been abroad. And they moved into a house in Balham, Printing was the only trade he knew, so with high optimism, he sank all his savings and his war gratuity into a print works of his own. Everything went wrong. Though his married life was happy and he became the proud father of four children, his business lurched from one awful crisis to another. For the next 12 years, he lived with the threat of closure and bailiffs at the door. He had fortunately the great gift of being able to lock up his troubles at the end of the day and lead a fulfilling life in other spheres. He returned to politics and gradually moved into public life. He was asked to stand for London County Council, worked for the League of Nations, and after his printing business began to at last prosper, became chairman of Camberwell Peace Council. <clears throat> His first contact with spiritualism was at a church in Clements Road, Ilford, Essex. 
He was by no means an easy convert. One of his hobbies was conjuring. He had a number of friends in the magic circle, and he attended the spiritualist church in the first place to see whether he could work out what trickery was used to produce phenomena. To his surprise, the clairvoyant made a deep and lasting impression on him. When he attended another church at Cloudsdale Road in South London sometime in 1934, he was told there were spirit guides who wished to cooperate with him and that he had undoubted powers of healing. He decided to test his views by trying to develop any psychic powers he might possess. Through home circles held in his own front room and at the houses of friends, he began to heal. Results were so good that he soon began to set aside several evenings a week, specifically for that purpose. First, experience of healing, someone who was miles away from him came with a dramatic suddenness. He had been told by a medium that the next time he heard of someone desperately ill, he must concentrate all his mind upon them. The opportunity came a few days later while attending a home circle. Someone told him about a friend of hers who was dying in Brompton Hospital from advanced tuberculosis with pleurisy and hemorrhages. He suggested they might try a healing experiment. Harry Edwards told what happened next in his 30 years, a spiritual healer. We sat quietly in meditation, employing our thoughts for his recovery. As I did this with my eyes closed, I became aware that I was looking down a long hospital ward with my attention focused on I was conscious of all the surrounding detail and of the man himself. So strong was the picture that even over 30 years later, I can revive it at will in all its vivid detail. When I checked the description of what I had seen with the relative of the patient, it was found to be correct in every detail. It proved to be my first experience of astral traveling. A week later, he received news that within 24 hours of his intercession, the hemorrhages had ceased. All pleuritic pain vanished, and the patient's temperature came down to almost normal. At the next check, it was found that the blood and sputum were free from infection. The doctors were amazed. Within three weeks, he was well enough to be sent to a convalescent home prior to discharge. Within months, he was able to resume full employment, and subsequent injuries established that the recovery had been maintained. Harry Edwards, still regarding his gift with an open mind, was prepared to accept that this man's recovery could have been a remarkable coincidence. But when other incidents of a similar nature occurred, he was convinced of his psychic power. Before long, his work was known throughout South London, and he had to set aside more and more time for healing. His fame spread through the war years. <clears throat> he considered himself simply as an instrument or channel for a higher power. Though he received many letters from patients who had never been in his presence saying that they had seen a man in a white coat bending over them at the time of healing. When a bomb destroyed his London home, Harry Edwards bought a typical suburban semi-detached house at Ewell in Surrey and turned the front room into his spiritual healing sanctuary. In the early days, he was in the habit of using many techniques suggested by other spiritualists, including trying to link thoughts with his patient and seeking a trance-like state for himself. As the years went by, he found all these things unnecessary. 
His methods became increasingly simple, but increasingly effective. He would talk quietly with the sick person, lay hands upon the affected part of the body, and in his quiet, authoritative voice, tell the sufferer that his or her ailment was under control. Absent healing, too, became simpler. When he found that his practice of asking a distant patient to concentrate on his illness at a specific time was not necessary. Once he had set his healing power to work, it seemed to function regardless of time or space. So many people were now writing to him and asking to see him that he had to employ a full-time secretary. He began to realize he was going to have to devote the whole of his life to healing. The room, the front room at UL, became far too small for his ministry, so he began looking for something more spacious. In 1946, he was, he was told of a house set in 14 acres of woodland and gardens at Cher, S-H-E-R-E, -E, which is a place, I guess, deep in the Surrey countryside near Gil Gildeford. Earl Lee, more specifically. <laughs> Built at the end of the last century, rambling, comfortable, and peaceful was the perfect place for Henry Edwards. He took the plunge and bought it for 8,000 pounds, leaving himself with 18 pounds in the bank. After two years, he began to get in the region of 3,500 letters a week. And as the number rose to over 9,000, he had to take on extra staff. All of and George Burton joined him to help with the patients. Those who were able to travel to Burroughs Lee were treated in a quiet wood paneled room like a chapel with a cross on the wall and masses of beautiful flowers from Harry Edwards' own garden. He loved flowers and grew and picked them in profusion. He usually performed his healing in a white coat. His hands were all left uncluttered, and he wore neither rings nor a watch. He believed the first task of a healer was to calm and steady the mind. And the first impression his patients got was of kindness, quiet strength, and authority. One of the most remarkable healing stories about him is told by Ramus Branch in the biography of a healer with his wife Joan Branch served with Harry Edwards for several years and took on the work of the sanctuary after his death. During harvest one August, <clears throat> Edwards' young niece Vivian was critically injured in a farm accident. She was sitting on a tractor when a bale of hay slipped forward her under the heavy wheel. She suffered appalling injuries, her body being crushed and literally twisted in the ground. The tractor had to be jacked up to release her. After she had been carried gently to the farmhouse, the local doctor arrived, examined her, then phoned the hospital. He was heard to say that she would probably be dead on arrival. Vivian's mother, Harry Edwards' sister, was informed of the accident and immediately phoned to ask him for absent healing. Vivian was still alive when she reached the hospital, but her family was warned that she would probably die during the night. Her injuries were too terrible for her to survive. Harry Edwards concentrated with all his power on trying to save young niece. She did not die that night or the day after. To the amazement of the whole medical staff, she began to recover. Within five weeks, she was well enough for them to consider her discharge. By Christmas, she was home. Though reticent about naming VIPs and royal personages who went to him for help, Harry Edwards was openly delighted that he could do something for Lady Baden-Powell. 
he had, after all, been one of the first Boy Scouts to join the movement. She first contacted him when due to him, due to keep an important appointment. She found her me and became had become very swollen and painful, and she could hardly walk. By telephone, he told her to proceed with her plans, and he would give her absent healing. Lady Baden-Powell had to be more or less carried to the train. But during the journey, she began to feel better. By the time she reached her destination, the pain had gone, and so had the swelling. After that, she often went to share to be pepped up, as she called it. <laughs> His public healing demonstrations, which started in a small way but ended with audiences of five or six thousand people at the Royal Albert Hall, became an important part of his work. He always conducted these sessions in his shirt and sleeves and emphasized the spiritual nature of any healing that people were about to witness. But his mischievous sense of humor sometimes broke through. When he had been accused by sections of the church of conducting his meetings in an atmosphere of hysteria, he turned to the audience slowly, rolled up his sleeves, and said, I'm going to start now. By the way, don't let's have any hysteria. It'll be in the papers tomorrow. Advancing years seemed to make no difference to his power as a healer. Ramus Branch tells how one cold, foggy November night, he and his wife, who had not yet joined Edwards at the sanctuary, over to Brentford, Middlesex, to see him conduct a demonstration. It took place in an unheated church, the yellow lighting casting an unreal glow over the packed audience. Edwards, Harry Edwards asked if there was anyone at present who was in constant pain. A hand shot up at the back of the church, and he beckoned forward the sufferer. Very slowly down the aisle came one of the most pathetic sights I've ever seen. <laughs> Brutal and honest. It was a man of, I should think, about 40. He had tousled black hair and a beard, and his clothes were like a bundle of rags around him, for he seemed to be like a tramp but it was the way he walked that stunned everyone to silence. He seemed to be half crouching and half shuffling sideways, almost crab-like. After a quick examination, Harry Edwards declared that the major part of the man's internal pain arose as a result of severe restriction imposed upon the abdominal organs by the badly twisted and fixed state of the spine. All the time the healing was in progress, the patient hardly said a word. But when it was over and he stood upright, he seemed transformed into a new person. I can recall now the gasps of astonishment from the congregation as the man who had been barely able to walk before now literally marched back to his seat. But it was the sequel to this healing that Ramus Branch said he would never forget. After the service, my wife and I walked along to Kew Bridge to catch a, a bus home. The fog was even thicker than earlier, and I asked her to wait a moment or two whilst I went into a cafe to get a bar of chocolate. As I came out, I was aware of a tall figure suddenly striding very rapidly through the swirling fog. So fast was he going that I had to step back quickly to avoid colliding with him. In that brief moment, I could see it was the rough-bearded man. As we both stood on the pavement gazing after him, 
We could hear him singing to himself as he vanished into the November fog. In the last years of his life, Harry Edwards visited South Africa <laughs> and Southern Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, and gave demonstrations of healing before vast audiences in both Johannesburg and Bulawayo. Back home at Burroughs Lay, he continued healing till the very end. On December 7, 1976, after a day on which he had signed batches of letters and made plans for the following day, he went to sleep in a chair, never to wake again. And by God, it's a travesty that this man isn't taught about in school. <laughs> Hidden. No more. All right, episode six.